Good morning, everybody. This is Ann Summers McIntosh, the Executive Director of the National Council on Disability. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we get started with the substantive content of our briefing, um, as a general housekeeping matter, we are thrilled to have such a high volume of attendees today for our briefing, which uh, clearly shows the level of interest in this topic. And although we have left the chat function open for attendees and presenters to flag any concerns regarding technical issues during the meeting, which the NCD team will monitor and respond to as needed, we kindly ask attendees and presenters not to utilize the chat feature to provide content or comments during the presentation. Please retain the chat feature for flagging only concerns related to technical or accommodations based issues. We've uh, coordinated with our presenters in advance to make use of screen share today, and we will be sure that any content presented in that view is also read aloud to ensure equal access to the information. Okay, let's get started. Andres. People with mobility disabilities have a higher cancer prevalence compared to the general population. Yet we experience disparities in cancer screening and treatment. That was the finding of a November 2020 report published in the Journal of General Internal Medicine. Contributing to those disparities are the absence of accessible medical tables, lift equipment, and wheelchair accessible weight scales. The absence of that equipment too often results in us not receiving physical examinations or thorough physical examinations, which could for prostate cancer and cervical cancer reveal their onset. Good morning. I am Andres Gallegos, Chairman of the National Council on Disability. As the federal voice for persons with disabilities across the country and in our territories, NCD, an independent federal agency, provides data-driven advice to the president, our federal leaders, on matters affecting the over 64 million people with disabilities in this country and in our territories. On behalf of the council, thank you for joining us as we unveil our report, Enforceable Accessible Medical Equipment Standards, a necessary means to address the healthcare needs of people with mobility disabilities. According to that same November 2020 study, unexplained weight loss can be a nonspecific cancer symptom. That alone underscores the need to capture our weight on a regular basis. However, today, for the absence of wheelchair accessible weight skills, physicians and nurses are asking us for our weight, are guessing our weight, or are foregoing capturing our weight altogether. This affects an estimated 13.7%, approximately 20 million people of the United States, that is the adult population, who report having a mobility disability. By far, mobility disability is the most common disability among American adults. Existing federal non-discrimination statutes Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and Section 1557 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act mandate as part of their overarching general non-discrimination obligations, the full and equal access to healthcare services. Those statutes implementing regulations do not, however, require healthcare providers to specifically have accessible medical diagnostic equipment. Our report reiterates our prior recommendations to policymakers that the presence of accessible medical diagnostic equipment is critical to providing persons with mobility disabilities full and equal access to healthcare services. That will only be accomplished through the adoption of enforceable medical diagnostic equipment standards. Now for clarity, when we refer to accessible medical diagnostic equipment or MDE, we're talking about height adjustable examination tables, height adjustable examination chairs, accessible mammography equipment, accessible x-ray equipment and other diagnostic equipment, as well as accessible weight scales and lift equipment to facilitate transfers. We, those who devote themselves to addressing the healthcare accessibility and health equity needs of people with disabilities know that the overwhelming number of people with mobility disabilities who cannot independently transfer from their mobility devices onto an examination table 
or an examination chair or onto diagnostic equipment, either do without, receive incomplete examinations and treatments, or receive less thorough examination and treatments. This further results in the unnecessary delay in the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of a great number of conditions and diseases. Now we stipulate that there are instances when it is clinically appropriate to examine us as we remain in our wheelchairs. However, there are significantly more instances when it is not. The absence of accessible medical diagnostic equipment leads to substandard care, misdiagnosis, or delayed diagnosis, and depending upon the facts and circumstances, can be discriminatory. As our report highlights, for the past 30 years, there's been a considerable body of literature published in peer-reviewed medical journals that document the unmet healthcare needs of people with mobility disabilities and that call for the use of accessible medical diagnostic equipment. For instance, a 2015 study published in the Disability and Health Journal concluded that individuals with physical disabilities have 75, 57, and 85% higher odds of having unmet medical, dental, and prescription medication needs, respectively. Consideration of the need for enforceable accessible medical diagnostic equipment regulations is not new. On July 26, 2010, the Department of Justice initiated a review of the accessibility of medical equipment with the publication of an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. Its purpose was to consider the possible changes to requirements under Titles II and III of the ADA to ensure that non-fixed equipment and furniture provided by covered entities are accessible. On January 9, 2017, in response to the 2010 mandate in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the US Access Board published its MDE standards. Those standards were, and to this day are, voluntary. They remain voluntary until adopted by one or more regulatory agencies, specifically the Department of Justice or the Department of Health and Human Services. On December 26, 2017, the Department of Justice withdrew its previously announced advanced notice of proposed rulemaking for the accessibility of medical equipment. Its withdrawal was to reevaluate whether regulation of the accessibility of non-fixed medical equipment and furniture is necessary and appropriate. In June 2020, the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights issued its final rule on Section 1557. It declined to incorporate the MDE standard, in part because it required the benefit of notice and public comment. Earlier this year, HHS OCR began their regulatory process for amending the Section 504 regulation. It issued a request for information that included questions on the MDE standard. This report has been just over 12 months in the making with the assistance of Dr. Susan Magasey from the University of Illinois, Chicago, her colleagues, including Robin Jones from the Great Lakes ADA Center, under the guidance of Anna Torres Davis, NCD Senior Attorney Advisor and Staff Lead on this project, NCD undertook to substantiate the need for the adoption of enforceable, accessible medical diagnostic equipment standards. The same standards created by our colleagues at the US Access Board. The findings of our report substantiate the need for enforceable, accessible medical diagnostic equipment standards. A copy of the report can be found on our website at ncd.gov. I now cede the microphone to Anna Torres Davis, who will introduce and moderate our panel. Thank you, Chairman Gallegos. Today, we are fortunate to have a panel of individuals representing the federal government, the private sector, and managed care to respond to the report and to share information regarding their efforts in the area of accessible medical diagnostic equipment. With us today, we have Dave Yanchulis, Director of the Office of Technical and Information Services, U.S. Access Board, Robin Sue Frabosi, 
Acting Director of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office for Civil Rights, Elise Bass, Senior Trial Attorney, and Clarette Yen, Attorney Advisor at the U.S. Department of Justice, Civil Rights Division, Disability Rights Section, Peter Thomas, Managing Partner at the Powers Law Firm and Coordinator of the Item Coalition, and Sarah Triano, Senior Director of Policy and Innovation at the Centene Corporation. Welcome to you all. Let's start with Dave Yanchulis at the U.S. Access Board. Dave, would you please start us off today by explaining what the medical diagnostic equipment standards are and provide a brief background on their development? I would be happy to, Anna, and thank you um, for in, and <clears throat> inviting the board to be part of this panel. We're, we're happy to be part of the conversation because it's a very important subject and we're really glad and welcome uh, NCD in the release of its recent report. Um, so the, the U.S. Access Board, like the National Council, is an independent federal agency. And a big part of its mission is defining accessibility through the development of accessibility guidelines and standards. Because a lot of what goes into ensuring accessibility really rests on defining and detailing what is necessary for accessibility. We've seen this uh, you know, over the years, starting out with the built environment, with transportation systems, with information and communication technology. And so over, you know, over the past several decades, the board's mission has expanded to encompass those other areas. And the most recent expansion of the board's mission uh, was really the result of the Affordable Care Act and its directive calling upon the board to develop standards specifically for medical diagnostic equipment. And we found too in our experience that where there remain persistent barriers to accessibility, more often than not, the main reason behind that is the fact that there is no clear guidance and details uh, with respect to specifications that explain how to achieve accessibility. So, you know, we look at the, you know, the first step in this process being really taken, uh, uh, addressed through the Affordable Care Act and simply the establishment of detailed standards that explain clearly how medical diagnostic equipment is to be accessible, what features this might have, its functionality and other criteria. So that's you know, really what got the board um, involved in developing these standards and gave it authority to do so. And so that, that work began, uh, the board issued a notice of proposed standards uh, back in February, 2012, where we put forward for public comment, proposed standards for medical diagnostic equipment. Um, we found that in the public comment, um, we really wanted to bring in more input, direct input. So what we did after we released those um, proposed standards for MDE, we organized an advisory committee known as the Medical Diagnostic Equipment Accessibility Advisory Committee. That group represented two dozen stakeholders uh, including disability and advocacy groups, uh, healthcare providers, uh, MDE manufacturers, and other industries, uh, and, and, and standard setting organizations. Also as part of that committee, we had um, representation uh, <coughs> and input from the Department of Justice, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and the um, Food and Drug Administration. And this, uh, committee really uh, pulled together a comprehensive set of recommendations. They, their report, which is available on our website, uh, not only establishes the rationale and reasoning behind uh, what ultimately became our standards, but there's also a really good summary of prior da data health um, care survey results, um, including the National Health 
interview survey, which clearly show the barriers and issues that have remained with respect to access to different types of medical diagnostic equipment. Um, so we, we really welcome um, that people look at that report for further information that, that explains and underscores the need for these standards. Uh, the report is also very helpful in explaining how the standards came to be and, and why they, they require what they do. Um, so we welcome that. And that report um, was submitted to the board. It, it included 54 consensus recommendations and that really became the basis for what we, the board ultimately issued as its accessibility standards for medical diagnostic equipment in January, 2017. Um, and, and those standards um, really cover the types of equipment uh, noted, uh, including examination tables, um, examination chairs, including those used for optical exams or, or dental exams, weight scales, um, radiological equipment, mammography equipment, and other types of diagnostic equipment. And those standards look and detail accessibility depending on the type of equipment and how it's used. For example, there are specifications that are specific to equipment that one must transfer to and lay on like an examination table. And that would include whether you're, you're laying face up or down or on your side. Um, we also cover type of diagnostic equipment that is one needs to sit in and transfer to. We also have criteria in the standards that are specific to equipment that that one does not have to transfer from a mobility aid to use like weights and scales. And we also have requirements for medical equipment that one would stand using typically. Um, so those standards are available on our website. And this work, you know, our, our mission and responsibilities were limited to just defining and, and issuing these standards. We didn't, we don't really have any authority to implement them. So that's why we regard them as you know, currently voluntary until they are implemented either by another federal agency um, or other uh, authority that has at the state or local level that has authority to implement such requirements. And so that's really kind of um, the board's development of these standards. Um, we invite you to uh, visit the board's website at access-board.gov for further information on these standards, including that advisory committee report and all our other accessibility guidelines and standards. And with that, Anna, I'd like to turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Dave. That was very informative and very helpful to us. Now let's turn to Robin Sue Frabosi of the HHS Office for Civil Rights. Robin Sue, given that HHS does not yet have regulatory standards in place for medical diagnostic equipment. What obligations do healthcare providers have under the laws that OCR enforces? Thank you, Anna, and good morning to all. And thank you and Chairman Gallegos for including the HHS Office for Civil Rights in this panel today to discuss this important report. And before I turn to your question, may I just say that at the outset that we so appreciate the good work that NCD has done over the years. The whole series of reports that you issued last year on bioethical issues were just excellent resources and recommendations about very critical healthcare issues that do underscore the importance of addressing the needs of people with disabilities in the overall HHS efforts on health disparities that really focus on, on equity. And the report that we're discussing today is another critical report that really does underscore the um, a fundamental issue about ensuring equal access. Because if, as, as Chairman Gallegos said at, at the outset, 
if basic diagnostic medical equipment is not accessible, it can result in denial of care. So I'm glad that you started with a question about what obligations healthcare providers currently have under the laws of that, my office, the, the Office for Civil Rights and Forces, because there actually are three federal statutes that OCR enforces that uh, protect the rights of persons with disabilities and specifically get at the issue involving accessible medical equipment. So the first law that everyone knows well is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act going back to 1973. And that applies to both entities that receive HHS funds, as well as programs or activities that HHS operates. And the second, also well known to everyone, is the Americans with Disability Act. And in, in terms of the Americans, Dis, Americans with Disabilities Act, our office does have responsibility that we share with our colleagues at the Department of Justice who are also on this panel uh, for Title II, which applies to state and local government services. And then the third statute that, that you may not be as familiar with, but it's been mentioned um, in some of the remarks made to date, is the Affordable Care Act also has important provisions. And Dave just mentioned um, provisions that have to do with, with setting standards. But there also is a non-discrimination provision in the Affordable Care Act known as Section 1557. And it um, does prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability and, um, and also other um, types of discrimination in certain health programs and activities. So all three of these federal laws have regulations that have been promulgated over the years and interestingly, all three of the uh, statutes and the regulations that have been promulgated under them have, um, have a number of provisions that specifically address the issues of accessible diagnostic medical equipment. And let me just briefly run through those to give you a sense of the types of obligations that providers have who receive federal funding. And the first, of course, is just the general non-discrimination provision. And that general non-discrimination provision also pro um, prohibits inaccessible facilities that result in excluding individuals with disabilities, or in the words of the regulation, defeat or substantially impair the ability to benefit, benefit from the services, programs, or activities being offered. And then there are provisions on program accessibility that also are very important because they specifically address accessibility of facilities and they add an important requirement that programs must be in the terms of the regulation readily accessible to individuals with disabilities. The third um, common provision is reasonable modifications. And that requires an entity to um, make reasonable modifications to policies, practices, or procedures when it's necessary to avoid discrimination on the basis of disability, unless the recipient can demonstrate that making the modification would be a fundamental alteration. And then finally, there are provisions about auxiliary aids or services that also are applicable to accessible diagnos diagnostic medical equipment. And there, a, um, an entity that receives federal funds must provide appropriate auxiliary aids and services 
And that does include modification of equipment, unless it does result again in a fundamental alteration or undue financial or administrative burden. Now, I'd, I'd like to point out that whenever there is a consideration of whether something is a fundamental alteration or an undue burden, the provider still has an obligation to ensure that individuals actually receive the benefit or service that's being provided. So let, let's take the example of a doctor's office that doesn't have a height adjustable examination table, but does have an examination table of a suitable height to allow transfers to the table from say a wheelchair. And so that's an example of where it could provide an equal opportunity. So it's always a case by case analysis about whether there's a violation and what is required to, if there, to remedy the situation if there is a violation. But what's important for everyone to know is that um, the, the ultimate test is that a, a, a person with a disability receives medical services that are equal to those received by, by a person without a disability. Thank you, Robin Sue. So here's your next question. How can HHS assist someone who has been denied equal access to health care due to the medical, <clears throat> medical equipment can you share a couple of successful enforcement examples? Certainly. And um, at the HHS Office for Civil Rights, we are here to help. And thank you to our great tech support who has now put up on the screen a slide. So, and, and I will um, read relevant portions of the slide because it's all about how to contact us. So there are many different ways to contact us. You can um, email us at our OCR mailbox, and that's uh, easy. It's ocrmail at hhs.gov. And we do, um, on a daily basis, look at the emails that come in and respond to them. Or you actually can call us. We have a toll-free number that is 800-368-1019. And we have a, a call center that really responds to all questions about civil rights and also an additional set of authorities that we enforce, which are the HIPAA regulations. And I know that our colleagues, again, at the Department of Justice also have a phone line that is dedicated to ADA issues. So that's another resource, but I wanted to let you know that please do feel free to come to us. We also have a lot of information on our website. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that our website is, is very easy. It's hhs.gov backslash OCR. And at the, the top of our homepage, you can see a purple box that says filing with OCR. And that if you click on that box, it gives you all of the ways that if you want to file a complaint with us, you can do so. You can do so over the phone. You can do so by in writing. And you can also use, we have a very convenient web portal that um, helps, helps you along the way in identifying whether this is an appropriate complaint to file with us. And it actually is available in 16 different languages. So uh, we hope that that is a resource also that, that people can keep in mind. And in, in terms of the complaints that we have received, and you asked for some examples, we, we actually do receive a lot of complaints about accessibility of medical care in general. 
But it's interesting because knowing how widespread a problem inaccessibility of diagnostic equipment is, we really have not received um, out of all of our accessible medical care, have not received proportionately a very large number of complaints that are directed specifically at this issue. And that's why the report that you have published this webinar and panel today are so critical to be able to get the word out so that people know what their rights are. And in, in the complaints that we have received about accessible or lack of accessible diagnostic equipment, we have been able to get relief both on an individual basis to the person filing the complaint and often also on um, a much broader basis that changes practices in a particular doctor's office. And you actually can see a summary of some of those complaints in the NCD report. And you'll see that the most common themes are inaccessible examination tables because of their height, lack of adjustability, or um, inability to, to transfer to the table. So, for example, we very recently just resolved a complaint where a wheelchair user could not access an examination table. And the remedy that we worked with the complainant and the doctor's office to put in place was that the doctor's office ordered uh, equipment to be able to assist with patient transfers for this patient and other patients who would need assistance and also training staff on, on safe patient transfer techniques. In another case, the doctor's office actually required a patient to bring her own Hoyer lift and staff to operate it. And um, clearly that is a, a violation of the laws and the regulations we have just been discussing. And in that situation, the doctor's office did purchase a Hoyer lift and trained staff to be able to use it. And we really, we've unfortunately seen a number of other situations where doctor's offices have required patients to bring their own equipment and their own aid to uh, assist in, in making transfers to examination tables. And we have been able to resolve all of those through a combination of the office acquiring needed equipment and the staff to assist along with staff training. And in other cases, we've, um, we've had, we've brought about much broader systemic relief that I mentioned, things like uh, hiring a section 504 coordinator to ensure compliance with disability laws and to adopt grievance procedures for 504 complaints and, and also implement policies for providing reasonable accommodations. Thank you, that was so amazing. Thank you so much. So my last question to you, Robin Sue, is can you expect HHS to issue a rule that adopts the Access Board's MDE standards? So that certainly is the question I know that's on everyone's minds and was an important recommendation in your report. And I can tell you, as, um, as we've been discussing, that OCR is uh, taking a long, hard look at its regulations, including regulations that address uh, a host of disability issues. So this is both our non-discrimination regulation under the Affordable Care Act, Section 1557, as well as our now um, close to 40-year-old 504 regulation. And we're, we're looking at ways actually across the board that we can update them to reflect a number of issues that NCD has raised in its various reports. I mentioned the bioethical series at the outset and that other uh, stakeholders have brought to our attention. 
and really issues that are raised in complaints where we feel a clearer regulatory structure would be very important for both the regulated community, the providers, as well as um, to consumers so that they really are aware of their rights. You also do recommend our um, issuing guidance and technical assistance. That's something that we do all the time. And as a matter of fact, we, we did partner with the Department of Justice a number of years ago to, to do a very comprehensive guidance piece on just accessibility of medical care for people with, um, with um, mo mobility disabilities. And in that guidance, we do specifically mention uh, accessible diagnostic equipment. And so the, those are, are just some examples of, of the kinds of guidance that again, we're taking a look at to see what are the needs and where can we issue information that would be helpful and what other partners can we engage? Terrific, thank you. And thank you so much for being here today, Ron. Now we're going to move to Clarette Yen of the DOJ Civil Rights Division. Clarette, can we expect the Department of Justice to issue a rule that adopts the Access Board's MDE standards? Well, before I answer that question, I just want to echo my fellow panelists in thanking you again for um, including uh, DOJ on this panel as well. So uh, we feel very privileged and honored to be here today. Um, but I probably will answer um, the question um, somewhat similarly to, to um, you know, my colleague Robin Sue at HHS. Um, at least for the Department of Justice, um, we really can't share publicly um, uh, information on our rulemaking beyond uh, what's published in the Unified Regulatory Agenda. Um, and that essentially consists of regulatory actions that federal agencies plan to issue in the near and long term. Um, this is actually something that's put out uh, twice a year by the Office of Management and Budgets um, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which is known as OIRA. Um, and they publish it in the fall and in the spring. Um, and unfortunately, as of this morning, when I last checked, um, you know, OIRA actually has not provided any updates to the Unified Agenda since last fall. Um, so I, I unfortunately cannot share any more information beyond what's currently out there. Um, as far as our regulatory activity goes. Um, however, I can certainly say that, you know, while as career staff, both my colleague Elise and I, you know, we're not involved in, or do we really have the authority to set the regulatory priorities for the department? It's something that ultimately lies with leadership at the end of the day. Um, but we certainly can, and we will share with our leadership, NCD's findings and recommendations on MDE um, including the recommendation that the department revise its PDA regulations um, to adopt enforceable standards on um, accessible MDE. Thank you, Clarette. Um, so since DOJ does not currently have regulatory standards in place for medical diagnostic equipment, what obligations do healthcare providers have? with respect to it under the laws that the Civil Rights Division enforces? Well, um, even in the absence of enforceable standards, you know, the ADA still requires, to provide, uh, requires providers to afford individuals with disabilities um, equal access you know, to all aspects of healthcare. Um, and the department has done work in this important right and continues to do so in this area. Um, you know, Robin Sue had mentioned in her remarks that uh, we did issue joint guidance with HHS, um, which is titled Access to Medical Care for Individuals with Mobility Disabilities. Um, and I just really want to highlight that it does address how critical MDE is in ensuring that a person with a disability receives medical services equal to those received by a person without a disability. Um, and in particular, the guidance provides that the availability of accessible medical equipment is really an important part of providing accessible medical care and that doctors and other providers must ensure that medical equipment is not a barrier for individuals with disabilities. Um, and it really does provide um, a lot of comprehensive examples 
of accessible medical equipment and discusses how um, this equipment is used by people with mobility disabilities, um, including adjustable height exam tables and chairs, wheelchair accessible scales, adjustable height radiologic equipment, um, and portable floor and overhead track lifts. Um, and I would just say to get sort of beyond the equipment itself, the guidance does recognize that simply acquiring um, accessible MBE isn't enough in providing equal access if no one knows how to operate it. Um, so the guidance does really stress the need for training staff in the proper use and maintenance of MBE. Um, and lastly, you know, the guidance does provide links to additional resources um, including federal tax credits um, and deductions that are available to private businesses to offset expenses incurred to comply um, with the EDA. Thank you so much, Clarette. We really appreciate that information. Um, now I want to turn to Elise Bass of the DOJ Civil Rights Section or Division. Elise? What has DOJ done in its enforcement work related to medical diagnostic equipment? And how can DOJ assist someone who has been denied equal access to care based on the lack of this equipment? Well, I'm very happy to be here today with you to discuss um, accessible medical equipment and to answer that question and to be able to share with you some examples of enforcement work that I've had the opportunity to work on. Um, in our enforcement work, we have consistently taken the position that all healthcare providers have to afford equal access to healthcare services and equipment. Um, and um, most of those cases are on our website, ada.gov and um, are searchable. But I'm gonna give you some examples of some of the cases um, that we've done um, just in the last couple of years. Um, in um, one recent case um, in Jefferson Radiology, um, a complainant, um, a very kind gentleman who has cerebral palsy and osteoporosis and who uses a wheelchair, he attempted to get a DEXA bone density scan at Jefferson Outpatient Radiology in Philadelphia, um, an imaging center that offers scans both by appointment and walk-in. It was convenient to where he lived and he showed up for a walk-in appointment. However, because of the height of the DEXA equipment, he needed assistance to transfer from his wheelchair to the machine. And he filed a complaint with us because as he alleged, the radiological technician informed him when he showed up that the equipment was not accessible and that they did not have staff available to transfer him. And the imaging center, he also alleged that they did not provide him the scan as prescribed by his physician. Well, we investigated and um, we found a violation and we entered a settlement agreement that, um, required injunctive relief, including a number of changes to prevent future violations. And we obtained $5,000 in damages for, um, for the complainant. And in that agreement, um, which again is on our website, ada.gov, um, the hospital um, had to ensure that it would provide individuals with mobility disabilities equal access the services, whether by appointment or by walk-in. And in order to do that, the center agreed to have staff available to safely assist individuals with transferring to imaging equipment or examination tables at all times when the facility was accepting patients. In addition, they agreed to ensure that each of its facilities had um, a Hoya lift, and other patient lifts to, to safely transfer patients, not only to DEXA machines, but to all examination tables and all other imaging equipment. Um, similarly, in a, another case um, on our website, Charlotte Radiology, we obtained similar relief. And in that case, a complainant who has paraplegia and uses a wheelchair attempted to schedule a bone density, bone 
density scan of her hip. But instead, they offered her a, a bone density scan of her forearm because it was easy and they didn't want to transfer her. She filed a complaint with us. We found a violation. And, um, you know, it's not medically equivalent to provide imaging of a different part of the body than directed by the physician. So there we obtain money damages and other policies. Um, another settlement that I'm happy to talk about, we reached um, last January with Tufts Medical Center. Um, Tufts Medical Center in Boston, outside of Boston, is a 415 bed academic medical center. And this agreement is fairly comprehensive. Um, and in the agreement, Tufts agreed to ensure that each of its clinical services, each of its distinct clinical services has accessible patient rooms with accessible beds, accessible medical equipment, to ensure that all individuals with disabilities have equal access to each of its distinct medical services. Um, and in that agreement, we defined accessible medical equipment broadly to include equipment that is accessible and usable to individuals with disabilities. And ancillary equipment to mean equipment that is used with examination tables and chairs and adapted or adjustable for individuals such as leg supports for gyneco gynecological exams, protective padding, positioning straps, or additional supports or rails to ensure safety. Hmm. Um, in that agreement, we also have provisions with respect to the purchases of new and future medical equipment. So it is forward looking as well. In that agreement, um, Tufts must ensure that where it is commercially available, a sufficient number of examination and treatment and other equipment purchased after the effective date of the agreement, but no fewer than one used in each clinical service is accessible and usable to individuals with disabilities. Um, for example, by providing adjustable height examination tables and adjustable height equipment where it is commercially available. Um, in addition, in that, in that agreement, the hospital agreed to train sufficient staff and have sufficient lifting equipment to safely transfer patients to all imaging equipment. Um, appropriate to each clinical service and available to each clinical service. Um, in order to do that, um, they also agreed to have medical equipment on which an individual must transfer that is capable of being locked or fixed into position to ensure safe transfer without slipping and to have protective padded surfaces for each piece of equipment, unless that is somehow inconsistent with the equipment's intended use. Um, and lastly, um, they agreed to post information on their intranet of the location and availability of each of, of all of the equipment so that staff over time would know the location and availability of that equipment. So those are just three examples um, of cases regarding equal access to medical equipment and services. And there are others um, that we are working on and others that are posted on ADA.gov. Thank you so much, Elise. So just before I let you go, if someone wanted to contact you to, um, file a complaint or inquire further about their rights. Is that at www.ada.gov? Yes, it is. And we would very much encourage people to seek information on ada.gov. The department has a new unified complaint portal as well that can be accessed through ada.gov. 
And we welcome and encourage complaints regarding if individuals are experiencing a lack of accessible medical equipment or any lack of access to equal medical care, um, particularly, for example, now telemedicine, um, which has become much more prevalent in um, the public health emergency. Individuals can go to our website. They can also, for information, call our information line, which um, is linked to our website. But right now, if people want to note it, I can give the phone number and the TTY number. Our information line, which is staffed Monday through Friday, generally um, nine to five. The telephone number is 800 514 0301. And there's a TTY 800 514 And both of those are um, on ADA.gov. And as I said, we welcome, um, we welcome to hear from individuals about what they are experiencing now and, and to file complaints in this area. Terrific, terrific. Thank you so much for being here with us, Elise. We appreciate that information. Let's move to Peter Thomas of the Powers Law Firm and the Item Coalition. Peter. Thank you so much, Chairman Gallegos and Anna for your invitation for me to speak today. And I wanted to also pay uh, uh, great respect and, and great thanks to the federal agencies that just spoke discussing how current law um, is being used and is uh, enforcing appropriate guidelines and appropriate requirements for accessible medical diagnostic um, equipment. Um, the ITEM Coalition um, is a 90 organization coalition of entities involving uh, representing patients and providers and people with disabilities and um, clinicians. It's quite a diverse uh, group of um, organizations, and we're very interested in this topic. We've got a subgroup of about 12 organizations that have been working on uh, this particular issue for some time. The coalition is, uh, has a disproportionate number of uh, mobility-related organizations on its steering committee, and that's one of the reasons why this really means a great deal to us including the United Spinal Association, the uh, Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, the Paralyzed Veterans of America, the Spinal uh, Spina Bifida Association of America, the ALS Association, and the Amputee Coalition. I happen to be an amputee myself, bilateral amputee. I have some experience with uh, lack of accessibility of medical diagnostic equipment. Uh, it's not directly on point, but uh, some time ago, uh, 30 years ago now, I was in a hospital getting uh, surgeries and uh, when I got in the wheelchair to get into the uh, the, the uh, bathroom or restroom in my my in my patient room, it was inaccessible. The uh, door was too narrow. Um, think of that in a, in a hospital that the wheelchair could not get into the patient room. It was pretty astounding to me. I had to go down to the lobby bathroom to um, take care of my business. So that that's one small example. It's my own personal experience with this, but it happened to be in 1989. And uh, I recall very directly when the DOJ put out regulations in 2000, I'm sorry, in 1991, following passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And here we are 30 years later, and these regulations have still not been issued in an enforceable way. Um, I completely appreciate um, the fact that the existing, the, the federal agencies have been uh, using the existing levers that they have, the tools available um, to do what they can to address these concerns when they are raised uh, to their offices. But think of the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that are impacted by this issue on a daily basis that don't have any capacity to file a complaint with the DOJ or the Office of Civil Rights. They don't even think in those terms. They just go to the doctor's office and, and get denied the care they need. Uh, they sometimes get so frustrated that they, they just don't go to the doc doctor's office. And I think both of those scenarios were laid out in pretty significant detail in the National Council on Disabilities report. Um, I thought the report was an outstanding contribution to this issue, and I truly hope that it stimulates additional activity to push this over the finish line. 
the myriad regulations that have been issued in the wake of the, uh, the um, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, the Affordable Care Act, the Rehabilitation Act, think of all of the controversial and non-controversial issues that have been dealt with by passing the law, regulating, creating enforceable standards, and having the federal agencies enforce those standards. That's how it's done. And for some reason, this issue has slipped through the cracks. And I think you're sensing in me as representing the coalition, and I guess I could say the broader disability community in general, that there is a quite a degree of frustration and um, impatience at this point with the fact that these regulations have not been codified and they have not been issued in final form. And it doesn't give the federal agencies the tools we, we think you need in order to truly enforce this, to set these examples, to uh, ultimately create a national standard that everyone knows they need to comply with, uh, and to really um, stimulate widespread adoption uh, of these standards. Chairman Gallego cited some of the uh, studies. We live in an evidence-based society now, it's especially with respect to healthcare. Um, you can't get anything done in healthcare unless you, unless you demonstrate the evidence, and the evidence states what you are trying to get accomplished. Um, here we have a situation where the evidence is clear. This has been studied and studied and studied. Numerous, uh, you know, uh, various uh, uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, uh, all kinds of research, studies, surveys have been done on this. And it's clear that there's major disparities in care with respect to people with disabilities because of this accessibility issue. And frankly, this is just physical access. We, we really haven't even gotten, the standards haven't even broached the issue of, of, um, of sensory disability and uh, the, the issues that, uh, that really affect the disability community in a very significant way in that realm as well. So we'd like to see additional work in that area as well. But first things first, we, we really truly believe these regulations need to be issued. They need to be debated through public comment and they need to be finalized. And we certainly hope that this, this very significant uh, and important report that NCD issues today will help stimulate that. Thank you so much, Peter. And so I take it from your comments so far that you fully support our recommendation to immediately start working on implementing regulations um, on um, um, accessible medical diagnostic equipment. Are there any other recommendations in this report um, based on your experience that you would prioritize for immediate action? Yeah, well, let me first start by saying that, uh, as the report noted, uh, I assume everything is okay from the waist down is not an acceptable annual, uh, annual physical response from a healthcare provider. And maybe that should be, that, that jumped out at me from this report more than any other quote. Um, I must tell you that, that, that really says it all. Uh, certainly in uh, the item coalition's view, the Department of Justice uh, should issue regulations. And we strongly encourage the DOJ to do that um, as expeditiously as possible. Um, we also believe the issuance by the Office of Civil Rights of additional regulations in this area uh, to address MDE uh, standards without delay is an, a critical imperative <clears throat> to getting this done because that creates the framework. That's the enforceable standard that you can now go forward and people not only will, will, be, will, will be accountable because they violate those regulations, but it also sends that signal to the country, to the providers across the country, to patients. It establishes expectations for access that is just can't be accomplished in really any other way unless you have specific uh, requirements and standards that the Access Board has worked hard to produce. Uh, they're four years old now, and um, frankly, I think they, they really do need to be implemented and, and enforceable. Uh, that also goes for the office, uh, the uh, Office of the National Coordinator and the NIH. Both of those recommendations in the report are really ex uh, very important. Um, added disability-related items to the meaningful use standards for ONC and a, bi a biannual national health facility accessibility survey 
by the NIH. That would really um, assess the data. Uh, everyone wants data. So uh, a biannual NIH study on this or report on this would clearly indicate um, the, the uptake, uh, who is failing <clears throat> to provide this level of access and who is not. Um, and then finally, I, well, there's two, two finallys. One is the Department of Education. The other is the ACGME, which is the, the um, Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. <clears throat> this would really, um, changes in this area would really <clears throat> send a clear signal to physicians across the country <clears throat> that they need to pay close attention to this, that they need to train their staff appropriately. Again, having the medical medically accessible uh, diagnostic equipment in one's office is a great step. <clears throat> but if it's not being used, if the staff's not trained on how to use it, if um, there's barely a recognition that it's even available uh, in that uh, physician's office or therapist's office or hospital even, um, then it's worthless. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Um, and so uh, again, let me, let me just, st and, and of course the ACGME uh, piece, the training medical residents to appreciate uh, the disability competency issue um, and uh, alerting them and making them aware of disability and how to, to treat and how to deal with people who come to their office with disability is a, is a key issue. Um, someone just mentioned a moment ago, um, telehealth. And that's a really important aspect of, of healthcare for people with disabilities. I think we've seen over the last year how important telehealth has become. And it's really allowed people with disabilities great access to healthcare that they just didn't have before, let alone that they would have had during a pandemic. But I also want to caution that telemedicine cannot become the deferred, the go-to treatment uh, mode for people with disabilities just because it's more difficult to treat them in an in-person environment. Um, it can't become uh, the default uh, type of care for people with disabilities, despite the fact that it offers great promise in certain, uh, for certain services and, and access to eliminate the physical barriers of actually getting to a physician's or a, a healthcare provider's office. I just wanna make that note because someone mentioned telehealth. All the other recommendations in the report are excellent recommendations. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient. That they're necessary because you have to get the, the, the facilities educated about this. You have to create training programs for, for providers to make sure that they're fully aware of this. You have to work with medical equipment suppliers and, and uh, innovators to, to design equipment that's universally accessible. Uh, but all of those things are not gonna happen unless you have an enforceable regulation. It, it applies across the board. This is no different than any other uh, the, 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 uh, the implementation of any other federal law. And so um, why for some reason it's taken 30 years for this piece to fall into place is beyond me. It's beyond the, uh, the disability community, but you, I, I, I just want people to take away that the item coalition representing the disability voice today um, has been working at this for a long, long time. We're perplexed, we're impatient, and we'd like to see some serious enforceable action on it. And thank you to the NCD for all you've done to advance this issue. Thank you so much, Peter. That was fabulous information. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Our final panelist is Sarah Triano of the Centene Corporation. Sarah, can you please talk about Centene's initiative on accessible medical equipment? and why Centene chose to work on this issue? Sure, absolutely. Um, before I get started though, I wanna give a quick shout out to Stacy Brown, the unsung hero of the council who was actually the first person I met when I attended NCD's National Youth Leadership Development Conference almost 25 years ago. I was a very young disabled woman. It was my first time traveling outside California and I was totally intimidated by Marca Bristow for those of you who knew Marka. <laughs> but Stacy made me laugh, feel right at home, hold my hand and introduced me to Marka, an action that set me on a path to eventually become Marka's program director at Access Living, a SIL director myself, a gubernatorial appointee, a presidential transition team member, and now the senior director for the nation's largest Medicaid managed care plan serving over 700,000 people with disabilities across the country. I wouldn't be where I am today, Stacy, without you. So. 
Thank you. Um, um, but I'll never forget one of Marka's last public speeches before she died in 2019 at the Nickel Conference, when she told those of us in the audience that if we really wanted to be the change we wanted to see in the world, we first had to listen. And that's exactly what we did at Centene. We listened to the leaders on Centene's National Disability Advisory Council, like Claudia Gordon, Colleen Starklock, Andy Imperato, many others who told our CEO in 2017 that the greatest barrier facing our members with disabilities was the lack of disability access in primary and specialty care providers offices and that we needed to prioritize it. Mm -hmm. We listened when a colleague of mine, Kate Campbell and I traveled around the country after that and met with our member advisory councils in seven different states and heard stories like one member in New Mexico whose doctor made her go to a zoo to be weighed because she used a wheelchair and he didn't have an accessible scale. You know, and we listened when the CMS Office of Minority Health put out an issue brief in 2017 that documented that Medicaid beneficiaries with disabilities received less preventative care than those without a disability because healthcare providers lack accessible exam rooms, diagnostic equipment, and programmatic access. So we listened. <laughs> Um, we found this situation unacceptable and we decided from our C-suite down to do something about it. So in 2018, we launched Centene's Provider Accessibility Initiative. And for the last three and a half years, we've been actively partnering with the National Council on Independent Living to increase the percentage of our providers across the nation that meet federal and state disability access standards. So how are we doing that? First and foremost, we set an expectation that if you want to do business with Centene, the nation's largest Medicaid managed care organization, you better be or quickly become accessible to people with disabilities. We routinely ask all 1.4 million of our providers with brick and mortar locations across the country now to answer a standard set of questions about the, uh, their disability access that's based on the ADAG, the PARS tool developed in California by June Kales and Brenda Primo, and a set of programmatic access questions developed by Mary Lou Breslin and the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund. Um, but we don't just take their word for it that they're accessible, because <laughs> a lot of doctors don't know what accessibility even means. So we partner with local centers for independent living to conduct on-site accessibility site reviews of the provider's offices to verify their level of accessibility and those on-site reviews are increasingly becoming a part of our standard provider credentialing process. But you know, it's still not enough to just verify that a provider's inaccessible and then put that in our provider directory as Chairman Gallegos has, has helped so many health plans understand. That doesn't help our members who need an accessible mammogram, right? So one of the reasons most providers give for not making their offices accessible to people with disabilities is cost. And when I was a SIL director, I used to think that that was just an excuse. But after working in Medicaid managed care for many years now, I've seen firsthand um, that for many smaller mom and pop Medicaid providers, it's a very real barrier. Um, some of them are struggling financially just to keep their doors open, particularly during this pandemic. And a tax credit that requires an upfront financial outlay isn't gonna help them. So mm -hmm. in 2018, Centene created a national barrier removal fund that providers can apply to for money to remove disability access barriers at their offices, whether they be physical or programmatic. And to date, over $1.3 million has gone out to 152 providers offices in nine states to remove disability access barriers, along with countless hours of technical assistance and training from the National Council on Independent Living, their local sales and our health plans. Um, the funded projects have included, among a lot of other things, 34 restroom remodels, 91 accessible exam tables with scales built in that meet the access board's MBE standards, including accessible dental, podiatry, OBGYN tables, 27 accessible standalone scales, 10 parking lot renovations, 12 front entrance ramps, 85 automated doors, 22 interior building improvements like foyer lifts, widening of doorways, providing digital enunciators for elevators, weighted blankets. And then my personal favorite was um, a doctor's office in Kansas that remodeled their waiting room. So they had a sensory avoider and a sensory seeker waiting area. Um, 
so, you know, although we've given out over $1.3 million in grants, we've received over $8.2 million in requests. And these are just requests from doctor's offices that voluntarily admit they're not in compliance and need help. The actual need far exceeds anything that Centene can address alone. Oh, I mean, we're just scratching the surface here. I, if we're really going to tackle this problem, we need everyone at the table, every health plan, OCR, DOJ, you name it. And we need every tool in our arsenal. We need carrots. We need sticks. It doesn't matter. We can't afford to let another decade go by without enforceable MDE standards. Whoever says that we need to reevaluate whether regulation of the accessibility of MDE is necessary and appropriate clearly hasn't been listening. Mm -hmm. Sarah, that's terrific, terrific information. So based on your experience and everything you've seen, which of the recommendations in this report do you want to see prioritized for immediate action and why? Yeah, um, so you know, although Centene is doing this work because our members with disabilities told us we should and because it's just the right thing to do, plain and simple, it would certainly help convince other health plans to do the same thing we are if OCR issued a regulation requiring health care providers to have accessible MDE that complies with the MDE standards. We implement the Barrier Removal Fund in three new states every year, and every time we go into a new state, we get the exact same question from the health plans and the providers. Why do we have to do this? I mean, it's really hard to tell them because you have to comply with laws that are 48 and 31 years old, but that no one ever really enforced. You know, a recent OCR regulation would definitely help us move the needle in that regard. Um, the recommendation about adding disability related data to meaningful use standards, um, I, I would echo what Peter said. It's probably a close second for me in terms of prioritization, because although we know intuitively that what we're doing at Centene is improving health outcomes and decreasing costs for our members with disabilities, it's really hard to prove it. Because as the report notes, there is currently no way in the healthcare sector to track disability at the population or health system level. But let me give you just an example of this real quick. Um, when health plans get eligibility data through what's called an 834 file, it always lists certain demographic information for our members, name, address, date of birth, age, sex. If it includes language and race, and that's a big if, nine times out of 10, it's inaccurate. And it never includes disability because a majority of state Medicaid eligibility applications don't ask Medicaid applicants if they have a disability. So the only way health plans really know the disability status of our members is number one, if we ask them, which we do, but that takes a lot of time, particularly if the contact information in the 834 was inaccurate, which most of the time it is. Mm -hmm. So if we want to identify our members with disabilities quickly, we have to get at it through waiver eligibility, rate cells, or claims. But even those methods are really imperfect because you can have a member who is, say, for example, deaf who won't show up in any of those sources unless you try to piece together certain medical diagnostic codes. And even then there isn't like a diagnostic code for deaf or blind. We have to take um, medically diagnostic codes like macular degeneration and retinitis pigmentosa and we have to piece them together. Even yeah. with developmental disability, you can track the population and IDD waivers, but what about people with developmental disabilities who don't receive waiver services and whose health claims are for an ear infection or stomach flu. So, right. you know, we, we, we need the data. That's really critical. But last, the last thing I would say is that although I absolutely agree with the recommendations in the report related to funding disability competency and awareness trainings for healthcare providers, I believe it would be more effective if we invested our nation's time and resources into employing more people with disabilities in the health professions. You know, I had a very dear friend of mine, Cynthia Waddell, who developed a brain tumor, and she asked me to go with her to her first MRI. And I'll never forget the look on the technician's faces when Cynthia and I walked in and they realized she was deaf. They had absolutely no clue how to do an MRI on someone who was deaf. And unfortunately, by the time they finally figured it out months later and had been trained, <laughs> Cynthia's brain tumor was inoperable and she passed away. So what would that experience have been like if MRI technicians had been deaf too? 
or better yet, if the people developing the MRI technology in the first place had been deaf, might Cynthia still be alive? I'll never know. But as her story demonstrates, when it comes to healthcare and people's lives, months, days, hours, and even minutes make a difference. Every day that we don't have enforceable MDE standards is another day that someone else's friend with a disability is dying. The time to act and the time to listen to the National Council on Disabilities recommendations and act on them is now. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so very much for being here today. We so much appreciate that information. And I just wanna take a second to say how deeply, deeply appreciative the council is to each of you for coming here today. The information that you shared with us surpassed everything that we could have expected and that we are very, very confident that this issue is going to further develop and move forward. And with people like you at the helm and at leadership, we really have confidence that that's going to happen. So thank you so very much. And so with that, I am going to turn it back over uh, to Chairman Gallegos to um, give our closing remarks and close our program today. And I thank you. As Sarah mentioned, we need all hands on deck uh, to address these issues. It's a matter of attaining and maintaining good health. It's critical, critically important for everyone, but more so for persons with disabilities. It's truly the predicate to our ability to live, our ability to learn, and our ability to work and earn. The adoption of enforceable medical diagnostic equipment standards is just one step towards health equity for persons with mobility disabilities. And is just one component of NCD's pursuit of health equity for all people with disabilities. On behalf of NCD, I wanna thank our panel members and everyone in attendance, and also express our gratitude to Dr. Susan Magasi and her colleagues for undertaking this project. Again, a copy of our report can be found on our website at ncd.gov. We had one, one last housekeeping matter that Ann will now announce. Ann? Thank you everybody again for joining us today. We've received several questions throughout the course of the presentations today regarding whether or not we will be making this, this information available to anybody who was unable to join or um, due to time change constraints, um, wasn't able to join for the full time. Uh, the answer is yes, we will be working on um, remediating the recording and posting that to our website and over social media. And we will send a link to that out to, um, to all people who registered for uh, later consumption. So please give us, be patient with us as we work on that, but we will work to get that done in, um, in, in the next couple of weeks and, and send that up to everybody. Great, thank you, Anne. This concludes our presentation. Have a great day, everybody, and be well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.